good evening. Um, very pleased to be here. Had a great afternoon. Uh, saw a glacier for the first time in my life. Um, we're not going to be talking strictly about architecture tonight because uh, doing that can be boring. Uh, I'm going to be I'm going to be going through a few characters who are very who are key in my in my career. People I've worked with, I crossed uh, my path, and uh, the title of the lecture is in order of appearance. It's what you see usually at the end of a movie, so it's about the cast. Um, the first character I'll be talking about is the entertainer. Uh, the entertainer is a high school dropout, someone I did not meet at Harvard. Uh, he dropped out of school, I think, at the age of 14 and was a professional drum player in various pubs and bars in Beirut during the war years. But my friendship with him starts at some point in the mid-1980s. Uh, at the time, he used to organize what he called musical therapy sessions in his small studio. Now, musical therapy sessions were kind of parties that started at some point late in the evening and ended up at some point early in the morning, where uh, we listened to music. We were not allowed to speak. So little I know about music really comes from this man, who at that time already had about 3,000 vinyl discs. That was a lot. And um, so we spent incredible evenings lying down on the floor, listening to music, not talking, drinking a lot of alcohol and sometimes some other illicit things and uh, and that was great but at some point in the early 1990s i was no longer living in beirut but whenever i would come back to beirut i would go straight to that studio with my suitcase literally before going home uh, checking if there was another musical therapy session that i missed so much but at some point in the early 90s he met uh, his special lady and they decided to take this uh, public. So he opened a club, and, uh, and that club really changed the face of Beirut, at night at least. And I thought that was very important. It was not just about entertainment. I thought it was a cultural and, in fact, a political act. In the early 90s, the so-called post-war years, where we were expecting great reconstruction projects to happen, that didn't really happen. We'll talk about that later. There were other kinds of reconstruction at work. Um, and Beirut was really booming. The, the nightlife in Beirut was really booming. And I was, I must say, part of that. Uh, my early years professionally were extremely tough. So I was working very hard during the day. 16 contractual engagements that didn't lead to construction. So to make up for that, I would spend my nights in bars, in various bars. This is me. I had long hair. I was thinner. Uh, this is not me on the pole, of course. Um, and obviously, running a nightclub and being married is a very difficult thing, so his relationship with this special lady didn't last very long. About a year and a half or two years later, uh, he calls me up and tells me I've had it with her. So he left the club he had started with her, and we decided overnight to build a club together. And that's, that was the first project I ever built. So in order to build a club, you have to have a site. We didn't have a lot of money. So uh, we tried to look for areas that were problematic, area that had, areas that had not reached uh, their real estate maturity, uh, areas that I describe uh, under convalescence in post-war years. Um, then the most appropriate area was located in a region called the Quarantine. It's at the northeastern tip of Beirut. It used to be the quarantine of the port of Beirut, and then, then it became a, a refugee camp in the early years, in the 1920s, for Armenians, and then after 1948, for Palestinians. And then by 1976, when the war had started, in the early months of the war, more exactly, I think in January of 1976, uh, the camp was burned down to the ground, and it was a very ugly story. Um, and uh, there were a lot of casualties. We say anywhere between 1,000 to 1,500 people who disappeared. But anyway, that area is still doomed. Uh, not, very not a lot of people live there. Nobody wants to live there. 
uh, in the quarantine, you find to this day the garbage company. You find uh, the tanneries, that stinks, you know, where they do the, the leather, uh, the slaughterhouses. So you imagine the kind of environment. That's why it was, it was relatively cheap to rent a piece of land there. So in order to find a piece of land, we had to look for a broker. And I was told that the man to look for was the broker of the church, because the church is the biggest land owner in Lebanon. It's, it's very, very powerful. So we go and knock on this guy's door, the broker. And it turns out this broker had quite a difficult past or quite a complicated story. Uh, I learned very quickly that he was the man behind what he calls cleaning up the quarantine. So when I, when I met him and during our first meeting, he told me, you're looking for a site in the quarantine. I know it like the palm, like the palm of, my, of my hands. I cleaned it up in 1976. So, so that was quite a, a scary introduction. And uh, uh, it turns out we did not uh, rent the land uh, through, uh, through the church. Uh, the broker led us to uh, someone else, the landowner, who's uh, the third person I'll be talking about briefly. The landowner also has quite a, uh, a complicated past. Uh, it turns out he was the nephew of um, the leader of the so-called Southern Lebanon Army that had branched out of the official army and turned out to be the militia that did the dirty job for uh, the Israeli army in the, in the, in the occupied uh, southern border uh, of Lebanon. And this guy was very street smart. He had connections in and out of Lebanon and in and out of Israel, did all sorts of odd deals in the 1980s. And uh, in the early 90s, when the militias were forced to dissolve and, and, uh, and turn back their weapons, uh, they had very little time to sell their weapons. It turns out the Christian Lebanese forces sold most of their weapons to the Balkans, who were igniting their own wars in the, in the early 90s. And it turns out the landowner was a key person, sort of a middleman between the Christian Lebanese forces and uh, those who were buying uh, uh, these weapons. And the story says that this man, uh, during the last deal, and we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, he, he, he failed to relay the money and fled to Brazil. Came back years later with a lot of money uh, under the cover and the protection of another uh, politician at the time. See, we have a very corrupt uh, political uh, uh, paysage in, in Lebanon. And, and during the, 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 the few years that he spent in Beirut uh, at some point in the 90s, he bought a lot of land. So the site, the plot that we, that we rented, for five years initially, belonged to this man. So this is general mood, the, the kind of people I, I had to collaborate with and that I crossed through my path in, my, in the early years of my career. It just set the mood for a project that already at the outset was quite complicated. The project was a nightclub, obviously, as I told you, uh, on a piece of land that we had rented for a short period of time, for five years. And it is this, uh, this site that you see here. Now, this aerial photograph shows something very odd. All Mediterranean cities usually start growing from the coast inland. Now, the coast is up there, and inland is here. So there's something very odd in this photo, because the inland part is a very, very dense fabric, and the coastal part is a very scarce fabric. And that shows you very clearly that there's a scar there. There's a very obvious scar. And that shows you that this, this, this zone, this area, is still to this date very problematic. It, the city kind of bypassed it as it grew northbound, as it sprawled uh, northbound. So the club I did is, in fact, uh, a building that has, uh, it is very low. It's got, it's 70 centimeters at its peak. So it's basically uh, pressed into the ground. Its facade is its roof. Mm? And the idea here is, uh, is that we, we, I refused to do a sort of vertical rhetorical monument that would be visible on the highway. I thought that by making it invisible, I would preserve this sort of problematic void. And by doing that, if anything, the, on the long run, uh, the, the project would become, if anything, more visible. And as you can see during the day, the building, when it goes to sleep, is completely invisible. And then it wakes up at night. It wakes up at night, and its, its roof opens up. So there is the, this back portion of the, of the roof uh, uh, is a lid that comes up. And then there are four sliding panels. 
um, and that, that we, were, we could do that because, because the quarantine is not populated at night, nobody lives there, so we could make a lot of noise. Hmm? Um, if you look closely at this building, everything about it is wrong by the industry standards. And I, I very proudly say that uh, I had not worked for any office, I had no previous serious uh, a professional experience prior to designing this building, and maybe that was a good thing. As I was designing it, I, I tried to, to, uh, to bring in contractors to build it, but all of them looked at me and thought I was too young, this thing was not buildable. Everything about it, uh, as far as the standards of the industry go, uh, everything was wrong. It turns out, interestingly, that years later, although this building was supposed to last only five years, it is now almost 20 years, Everything that was wrong turned out to be completely right. Hmm? So much for the building industry uh, <laughs> and the contractors. Uh, and in fact, it never leaks, although we open and close the, the roof, uh, I don't know how many times, every night, even during the winter. The only parts of it that leaked were, in fact, uh, the waterproofing membrane underground behind the concrete, which is stock uh, regular uh, standard uh, as far as the, the construction industry goes so much for the, for the, for the uh, construction industry. Uh, so this is it during the day when it's asleep, this is it at night when it wakes up. So you see that the, the, the under flap of, the, of, that, of that lid has uh, reflective panels. It, it reflects the warm lights and the warmth that is below uh, when you're above, but it also reflects the sound to the outside. Uh, this is it inside. And uh, so the, the photos you see here are, are photos that, uh, went, well, that, that, that date a while back when the building was still uh, pretty new. The steel, was, the steel panels were out of the mill, so they were, they were black, but we didn't treat that steel. Now you look at these photos that are, they are more recent. The steel has rusted, it was untreated, but they're four millimeter thick panels. And interestingly, 20 years later, they're still there untreated. Huh? they still work. So this is the roof opens at the early hours of the night and then it closes that way. And then it gets crowded, very, very crowded. The club is still kicking, if anything, uh, more, than, more, than, more than the early years, uh, which is very rare for a nightclub. And, and it's amazing what cheap materials can do for you. This is, those are plexiglass thin panels that uh, obviously nobody uses in, in the building industry. But uh, these, these cheap materials sometimes do wonders for you. See, they, they give almost a sort of a liquid uh, tableau uh, picture. And so they, when you're below, you see this kind of surreal representation or image of the city, which is very dynamic because it keeps moving. And at night, when the cars drive by, you see the lights sort of flickering in a very, very disco way, almost hallucinating view. Um, what you see here is the club at night when it operates and then in the early hours of the morning uh, when, uh, when people go out it's already, it's already daylight and obviously uh, the people uh, who are in there are not in such a good state. See this man here is completely passed out. This woman uh, is doing I don't know what. This woman will probably regret what she's doing and the bouncer doesn't really care. So those were, this was the first building I ever built. I drew it down to the last bolt because I didn't have an office. I was working solo, uh, drawing uh, during the night, a building during the day. It was a very intense six months. Things happened very quickly. Obviously, we had very little money to build. The parking is, is, uh, is part of the setup. So the idea here is that the cars park around the building with a certain distance. And uh, what you see in black is is, is the tarmac, so uh, some guys who have nice cars keep turning around this carousel you know, to show their beautiful machine. And if you have a great machine, you will park it right there on front. And if you have a, a very cheap car, it will probably end up somewhere in the back. Um, and this is a more recent picture of it. So now it's completely, completely rusted. This is me. I like to pose in front of my buildings. Uh, another character I'd like to talk about very quickly is our Prime Minister, for our ex-Prime Minister, who was assassinated in 2005. Um, the Prime Minister was a, was a very key figure uh, in the post-war period. He led many of the successive governments and he represented 
uh, a very a major project of reconstruction, the reconstruction of a nation. Uh, that project was never really, never, never went to its full fruition. Uh, but the prime minister had big ideas. We might not agree with all of them, but uh, he was a key person also in the reconstruction of the city center. That was a very symbolic project. This, the former historical city center of Beirut was a no man's land. It was a battlefield from 1975 until 1989, 1990. And by the end of the hostilities, the city was completely destroyed, the, the center of the city. And obviously the state did not have the means to rebuild not only itself, but even to rebuild the capital. So the prime minister, who was a tycoon, had started uh, doing business in Saudi Arabia, became a, a protege of the king, um, and by the 1980s was already a billionaire. So at that point, he starts a company, private company, that takes charge of the reconstruction of the city center. Now that's very odd, because on the one hand, he's a prime minister, he represents state institutions, and on the other hand, he's an entrepreneur, uh, a, a billionaire, a businessman, a big tycoon. And so a lot of, a lot of us will tell you that there was a problem there at the outset, but uh, Beirut or the prime minister had a, had a, had a, had a, had a sort of a hyper-capitalist project for the reconstruction of the nation. But that tells you a lot about the importance of the private sector in Lebanon, particularly in the post-war years. We were not able to rebuild the nation. We were not able to rebuild our institutions. So the city now is completely in the hands of the private sector. This is what Beirut looked like in, uh, in the early 1990s before the reconstruction project started. And at that point, prior to coming back to Beirut, I was still in graduate school and I was fortunate to work with the late Lebius Woods, uh, who was very fascinated by these issues of war and architecture and was working on Zagreb, on a publication on Zagreb, and kind of forced me to work on Beirut. And I was already aware of the danger of aestheticizing the, the, or fetishizing the ruin. But uh, he had a great influence on me at the time and we started the project uh, that uh, I called Evolving Scars. It started by literally rebuilding a replica of a ruin, uh, a very generic building, because it was not about architecture, and bombarding that, that ruin, and, and, and really uh, feeling the fascination I had and we had about uh, the, the violence of war on buildings and, and, and the, 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 the very uh, expressive um, potential of that, if anything, the danger of being um, uh, obsessed and, and fetishizing the ruin. Um, and we very quickly realized that a lot of these ruins, a lot of these cadavers had to disappear. And the idea was to make an architectural exercise out of their demolition. Now, I'll stop for a second. This was very important because as far as I know, it was probably and still is as far as I know, um, the first exercise of, of that consists of making an turning the demolition into an architectural act. Us architects usually erect matter. Huh? Uh, we build things, we erect matter. But here, there was already uh, a will uh, to, make, to turn the act of demolition into an architectural act. And I'm saying literally the act of demolition, not representing uh, the disappearance of matter, but in fact, the actual disappearance of matter becomes an architectural act. So what you see is what I, this, this thing is what I called the memory collector. And the idea was to collect memory data uh, that can be quantified and simultaneously uh, demolishing the building, collecting its ashes in its peripheral membrane. And the intensity of demolition would be proportional to uh, the amount of information that is being collected. And this would go on as the membrane would fill up with the ashes of the building. And you see it hitting almost its saturation point. And at that point, the memory collector would start digging its own hole. And the scarring process would be over once the structure has completely disappeared. The anecdote here was that Beirut, which already has six archaeological layers below it, it's a very old city, it, the last layer would be completely immaterial at the image of its time. And uh, after BO18, which was a great su success as a, as a, as a, as a nightlife uh, venue, uh, I became very quickly labeled as an entertainment architect. So my second project was also a bar and restaurant, 
this time also in a problematic site located literally at the edge of the former city center which was being rebuilt. A lot of old structures were being renovated uh, and, and manicured and so manicured that they turned into postcards and you didn't know the real from the fake. Uh, I call them the transvestites. You didn't know the male from the female. You didn't know what was real and what was not real. And I'm given this house that was supposedly under historical protection. And um, the idea here uh, very quickly was not to renovate it in a conventional way because I call this these transvestites, um, I call them a, a dangerous falsification of history. I owe this project to my structural engineer who started drawing to me, sketching out the basic pro the process of how to keep the skin of a building up while you're gutting it out. And I think this process is quite morbid but interesting in a way because it's as if I took your body and put belts to keep your, your skin in tension but then I, I basically got it out everything that was inside and replaced it by another animal. What others do at that point is that they, is that they, uh, they, they remove the belts, they apply some blush, they do some, some plastic surgery and bring you back the, the supposed glitter and beauty that you supposedly once had when you were young. I refused to do that, I refused to turn this into a transvestite and I thought that the crime or the act that we were performing by putting another monster inside was history. History was in the making. Um, we also replaced the roof, but I'll get to that in a moment. We built a bar uh, instead of the roof in this circular section. And uh, very quickly, I'll take you through the plan. Uh, the restaurant downstairs had one huge table that sat about 50 people. And in the center of it, in this sort of H shape that you see, there was a stainless steel um, 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 a circuit, a plate, uh, a plateau, on which uh, the service, um, the, the waiters walked and they were trapped, they were prisoners inside the table. They never shared the space on, in which the guests were seated. And their only escape of that was the hole and the staircase that took them back to the kitchen where they belong. If you look closely at the section, you will see that the waiters were walking on a plane that was 40 centimeters lower than the plane you were seated at. So you always looked down on them and they looked up to you. It was a very odd setup. Huh? But that was my revenge or my take on, on, on the lack of public space and, and celebrating the sort of marvelous denial that the post-war bourgeois society was, was kind of going through. And I'm, I'm not being cynical here. I'm, I'm also part of that society. Uh, but trying to produce meaning and celebrate this, I, I would say, in, hopefully in a meaningful way. This is a section in the other way around. So you see the bar upstairs that is in this circle. It's circular because it, it describes this, the circular movement of the roof that opens. It's kind of like these things you put the bread in, you know. Huh? And I'll show you that in a second. But the, but the bar is suspended almost 10 meters above uh, the tables because, because we, we had removed the intermediary level. So it was very cathedralesque, almost uh, over pretentious posture of the bar that became suddenly this kind of divine thing that floats above you. Bars are very important spaces for me. This is it under construction. Again, uh, it was a very close collaboration with, with artisans, uh, just like the first project. And now you see closely the facade that we did not replaster. We kept the, the temporary beams up and we've added subframes of the wire mesh. And I call this the poetry of decay. So the idea is that the facade would continue to rot and we would play on that, on the beauty of that the poetry of decay. And it's amazing what this can do for you. It in fact created very interesting patterns. But wherever we've, we had an intervention or an addition, it was very much assumed. It had, if anything, the violence of a military uh, uh, a, a piece of uh, military machine. That's the bar upstairs with the roof that is open. Uh, and as it opens, it sort of flips down and half of it becomes in the room downstairs. This is the roof from outside, closed, open, closed, open. See, it works. Again, it never leaked, <laughs> never leaked. That's the setup downstairs. The chairs were, had a very high back. They were very heavy, so someone had to open the chair for you. So you sit in and, and then you sat and ate, but you couldn't talk to anyone. You could only look at each other. It was a very intense setup. Some people hated it and hated me for doing that. They thought it was immoral. Others loved it for the experience. 
The third project uh, and the last of the entertainment uh, projects, uh, and all these projects are temporary, yeah? they had a very limited lifespan, uh, is a restaurant, a sushi restaurant, absurd. Again, on a very problematic side because this is also part of the demarcation line, very close to the city center. This is West Beirut, this is East Beirut. But when we started this project, this area was still not renovated. You can see the building next door. It was squatted by Syrian workers and refugees who were probably living off $150 a month, huh? low-wage workers. And here we are building a restaurant, erecting a very pretentious structure to house a sushi bar huh? that's going to be serving sushi at $50, $100, $150 a pop, what the guy makes uh, in two weeks or in a month of work. Any reasonable architect would turn his back uh, in front of such a commission um, and, and would, 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 would run away from it because it's, 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 not, it's not correct. It's, um, but those are very sour realities and we decided to do it. And that's why this building looks so absurd there because it completely assumes the absurdity or the impossibility of its existence on this particular site and at this very particular moment in time. You can see that the building next door uh, people were living without handrails, without running waters, without, without running water, without windows, and and uh, and uh, the sushi bar obviously inside was a, was a very different situation. It has the precision of a Swiss watch, and in the middle of it was a circular room that moved up and down into the tower, it up from up to the street level, and down it lands in the middle of the bar. So it celebrated the arrival and the departures of of the, of the guests. You see it here inside. In this project, it's like the first two, we were in charge of everything, every little detail. We bought nothing from the building industry. We, we drew and, 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 and built everything down to the ashtray, the lamps. Uh, we were in complete control. Every single accessory was part of this setup uh, because uh, we were in complete control and we were constructing and building situation, situations and every single object was part of that situation, was, was, a, was, a, was a tool. Um, so you can enjoy your sushi while in complete denial of what is happening literally behind the wall. So this is a sort of a forced situation of denial that is imposed on you. And sometimes by pushing the train so fast, you can make it derail. So the idea here is not to be uh, naively in denial of the situation you're going through, but if anything, voluntarily uh, pushing it to an extreme. Your only relationship to the outside world were, was the sky, through the skylights, and nothing but the sky. After my entertainment uh, period, and at that point, I decided it was enough because I was, I was, I was labeled as the entertainment architect. I had worked on, on only temporary projects. In fact, my first three projects had a, a very short life expectancy, which means that uh, they were, their life was tied to the, 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 the length of the contract, the rental contract of the piece of land on which it they were built. So they had a life expectancy that varied between five and nine years. It's a very odd thing for an architect because we, 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 our, our profession is still in the Stone Age. We, we erect buildings um, and buildings are, are built and thought of, if anything, uh, in permanence, huh? uh, unlike uh, unlike what is happening uh, uh, in, in this electronic age, where everything is so much more dynamic, so much more uh, volatile. We, we erect things out of matter, and we have this mentality of permanence. But strangely, Beirut brought me to work and built my first six projects in complete opposition to that, hmm? with uh, designing buildings knowing exactly at what they, they should be bulldozed, which is very odd. And maybe this allowed me to take positions I wouldn't have taken in permanence. But uh, a few years later, I think by 2002, uh, I meet this young entrepreneur who was courageous enough to commission me a permanent building, a residential building, although at the time most developers thought that this was incompatible with me because no one would buy or rent or live in a building I designed and raise his kids in it because they associated me to places of debauchery. I was not reasonable enough to, to build houses and apartments. So, the first permanent building I did, strangely, sat right next door to La Centrale. It's this building you see here. And right at the beginning, the developer tells me, um, 
We're going to do what they call in, the, in their jargon, we're going to do a shell and core development. Shell and core means uh, I'm in charge of the shell of the building, its facades, and the core, the, the vertical circulation cores. And I should do as little as possible in the livable spaces, in, in fact, the functional spaces, because in this, uh, in this sector of the industry, in the high-end sector of the residential markets, uh, people come in with their own decorators and their own architects who are far more reasonable than me and, and for m behave much better than me and are smarter than me. So they don't want me. They want to come in with their, own, with their own architect and they would want to do their own thing, which is very odd. You know, I come from six buildings where I was in charge of the ashtray, literally every single lamp. I was in control of building the situation and then suddenly I'm told, you have to disappear. You have to be as silent as possible. And I was in kind of a masochistic, uh, voluntary uh, 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 attitude. I said, OK, if it's about that, we're going to try to make sense out of this. And we're going to take this all the way to the extreme and see where this goes. So I refused to design the morphology of the building. I took the building law and I applied the setback literally as the law on this site allows me to do it to get the maximum volume on this particular site. Moral of the story, I did not design the shape of the building, I applied the building law. Two, if they don't want me to leave any trace of my passage inside, in the spaces uh, of the building, in the inhabitable spaces of the building, I'm going to apply this, this formula of shell and core and take it to the extreme. So I will have the shell be structural and the core, and I will avoid having any columns inside. I will have continuous shafts on the blind walls so you can put your bathrooms and kitchens anywhere you want. And I will leave no trace of my passage on this building. So number two, I did not design the plans. I, let, I kept them completely open for the smarter architects who will come behind me and develop them for their own clients. And pretty soon, the seven apartments were sold, and I get calls from the seven, seven architects asking me to give them facades, which I refused to do. I told them, do your job, design your plans, and then, and then project your, uh, give me your interior elevations, and I'll project them to the outside. And it's exactly what we've done. And this is why the, the windows are not aligned, uh, although it was very trendy to do that at the time, but I didn't do it to be trendy or cute. It just happened very organically, because these are the projections of the interior facades, I didn't draw them. So I recap, I did not draw the morphology of the plan, uh, or the morphology of the building, the shape of it. I did not draw the plans, I did not draw the elevations. The three basic prerogatives of the architects, I gave up. Hmm? So I didn't draw this building, but yet I like it. So much about drawing, so much about drawing. Huh? Uh, so, but just, just, just to recap again. So in the temporary buildings, I was in complete control and in the, per, in the permanent building, I had absolutely no control. I, I did not design in the conventional sense of the term. After that came a series of residential buildings because this was a very successful venture for the developer. And I worked with young developers. This here is a much more humble gesture, but uh, nevertheless for me very important politically because it was an act of resistance against the conventional models of developers, which consist of having blind cores in the center of the plan, so you get out of the elevator on the 15th of August at noon and you have to turn on the light to put your key into your door. And I think this is a crime in a Mediterranean city. So what I've done is, is a very simple story that you can read on the facade. You wake up in the morning, you get out of your bedroom, you walk down the stairs around the olive tree into the kitchen, you grab a cup of coffee, you go to the living room, you take your newspaper and then you go down and see your kids without ever walking inside if you felt like it. Every single part of the plan could be connected to any other part of the house while walking outside. So I kind of pushed you to the outside, pushed you back to the city, uh, reconnected you with the neighborhood, with the street, uh, almost, uh, you know, in an, almost in a carnal way uh, and in a forceful way. But that to me is a political act. That creates, in my opinion, a far more interesting uh, 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 urban fabric and a far more interesting social fabric, uh, certainly more healthy than these closed boxes that deal with the outside as if the outside and the street were hostile territories. They were, produ they were producing a bad social fabric and I think this is a political act because it reconciles you, it forces you to reconcile with the city. And this is the only thing you see in the facade, no funny stuff. This is me again posing on my building. 
probably the probably the closest thing I've done um, in in the residential sector that maybe reconnects a little bit with my with my entertainment years is this building that we just completed. Um, this is another complicated story in terms of its location. It's located in an area that has no residential projects around uh, in a sort of a bad area of the city. And this developer who usually does high-end developments come, comes to me with this plot and I tell him this is going to be difficult. You're pushing it this time. And he says, no, we're going to design a building. We're going to create a building uh, for playboys. The building where there will be no families, no kids, no school buses. And then he looks at these two cars I have parked inside my office because I have a freight elevator. He says, why don't we do that? Uh, we'll drive the cars into the apartments. So we ended up doing this. Although the apartments are not very big, you can see the scale of the car relative to the apartment. So the idea here is if you were in one of my clubs and, um, and, uh, and you were lucky enough uh, to leave the club uh, with someone, you could drive the car all the way up, up the building into your apartment. And if you were lucky enough, you would stay in your car, not even go up to your bedroom. Spend the rest of the evening in your car. And we built this thing. It's almost complete now. This is it. And he was right. There are no families, no kids, no school buses, only playboys. This is my bike in the, in the elevator. This is me riding the bike in an apartment, a car in an apartment. The son of the president, uh, the story of this building um, is interesting because it was, it was full of wrestling with my clients. Uh, don't do this, don't do that. Yes, I'll do this, I won't. And we spent uh, two, three years literally wrestling every day. And the result is a building that's very ugly. I'm very proud of it, but I kind of like it because you see in it the conflicts and, and all the complexity uh, and, and the differences between what would be the, the, the literal the literal interests of the developer and my positions, and, and just we just let it go. I kind of like it because it's not a pretty building in the stupid sense of the term. Uh, it's a building that comes out of bad soil, really. And if you ever go to Beirut, it's very visible. It's at the northeastern entrance uh, of the city. Uh, you see it. It has a poster in front of the port, and it's right there sits like a robot. This is the roof. This is where I live. Beirut is a very, is a very complicated fabric. And, and you see very visibly the bankruptcy of the institutions, the lack, of, the lack of, of, of regulating mechanisms. And the result is, I, I like to, to describe Beirut uh, like a room that is packed with people that are shoulder to shoulder. But these people are solitary. They are completely. Uh, uh, denying the presence of others. This is what happens when there is no consensus, no consensual territory around, around which people meet and no regulatory uh, mechanisms to organize the city. You end up with this. It's a catastrophic fabric. It's ex extremely complex, but it can be very interesting. And I chose to live there and I built my house overlooking that. Uh, it consists basically of one large window, 12 meters by six, and everything is, around, is organized around this. The two lights that you see above, I'll talk about in a second. And in the middle of that window, there's a bridge, which is probably the highest pedestrian bridge in Beirut, overlooking uh, my, my living room, but also the rest of the city. And above is my, is my pool, uh, standing in, uh, floating in the middle of all of that. And, and these two things you see are not cannons. It's interesting because when we installed them, I had the secret services of the army coming in to check out and make sure this was not a military equipment. And one of the landowners uh, below, one of the one of the apartment owners below, uh, was 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 complaining about them because in 2006, when uh, the Israeli planes were attacking Beirut, uh, they apparently had shot at too well because it looked like. Uh, a missile launcher, and he started telling me uh, they'll be shooting at our building, will be the first uh, building to be hit, remove them immediately. And I told him, don't worry, I'm sure they know what uh, the, the brand of your underwear. They know where they're shooting. And if they don't, and they bombard me and I'm dead, I'll be the victim of my architecture. That would be a nice ending to my, to my story. Uh, very quickly, this is another very problematic uh, project that is uh, under construction right now. 
um, and very typical of Beirut, unregulated territory. My client comes to me with a site that sits in the middle of agricultural land, very close to the center, which is very rare. But the city is getting very close to us and pretty soon there will be buildings around us. But what's very odd about this site is that it has a perimeter of almost 400 meters, out of which only five and a half meters intersect with public domain. This means that the remaining 390 something meters uh, could be, if anything, could be facing a blind wall. What typically people do because there are no regulating mechanisms, no master plan, they build and they think of their, themselves, they don't think of anything around them. So the chances are the guy who's going to build next door is going to turn his back to me and erect a blind wall, literally in front of me, uh, which is in complete contrast with the situation right now. So I have to build for the present, but also for the potential catastrophes that will happen. And what we've done, this is another building I didn't design, is that we've basically set up, uh, we, we've, we have stretched the plan along the whole periphery, opened it up on the whole periphery, and, and, and offset inside and kept on offsetting as I went up to give myself enough breathing space in case a catastrophe happens. But I've completely opened the whole periphery in a, in a, in a very kind way to kind of invite my, my, my future neighbor to do the same instead of turning my back to him. And that designed itself literally and gave me very, very odd but very interesting floor slabs that literally drew themselves by a, by, by a very scientific offset of these slabs as they went up until they reached the maximum height of 50 meters. And along the whole periphery is what I call a bar. It's not a handrail, it's 50 centimeters deep, 110 centimeters high, exactly like the bar you have a drink on, along the whole periphery. And it creates great terraces for all the apartments, very long elongated apartments and floor slabs, completely open to the outside, that celebrate the, the, the views that we have right now, but that would celebrate, if anything, the potential proximity with the neighbor. And I think this is a very courageous act. So you see the kind of slabs I'm getting, and you can imagine how the apartments will be inside these slabs. Uh, in complete opposition with that is a project that is also under construction, uh, probably the highest building I've, I've, I will be building to date, at least in, in Beirut, 100 and 50 meters high, approximately 38 stories. But this is a very closed by program, a very closed community, a very high end, a very high end condominium. And uh, it hits a sector. Uh, the kind of mentality here is, 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 is at the exact opposite of what I usually do. So sometimes you have to work with that situation. And we took it and we really pushed it to another extreme here, uh, this phobia, this phobia of the outside. The more you have money, obviously, the more you're scared of whatever is outside in the city. And usually, these buildings are equipped with what, they, with what they call a control room that is located in the basement. And this consists of a room with a lot of screens and a guy with a cap, with a, with a, with a, with a, with a hat, who looks at, at everything and knows and watches uh, and makes sure that uh, nobody comes in, nobody comes out, uh, nobody is not supposed to be in. Uh, so. I took that control room and pushed it out of the ground and made it fly. You see it held here by a, uh, by a, a crane. And, um, and the idea here is that during the day it goes up so that the, the security uh, team can watch literally uh, from above uh, between 50 and 80 meters of altitude, can watch the site and they light it up at night. Becomes like a lantern and it also parks at street level at the entrance of the complex. There's obviously much more to that project, but uh, I, will, I will move a bit faster now. The corporate mogul is um, another interesting story. This man was probably and still is the richest man in Kuwait, which ranks him pretty high up as one of the top, I don't know, uh, fortunes in the world on a very interesting site uh, that overlooks the, the Shouf uh, Cedars Reserve. Um, and the idea here was not to build a house, but celebrate this incredible view on this plateau that sits at just the right altitude. And at some point during the year, the clouds stop literally at 10, 20 meters under you. And you have the, the feeling that you're floating above. And the man said, I want to die here. So what I gave him as a conceptual image in the beginning was a panorama 360 degree and told him 
This is where you sleep. This is where you have breakfast. This is where you shower. This is where you have sex. This is where you entertain, so on and so forth. Along this panorama, and he loved the idea that there would be no building. Um, and then a couple of months later, I, I present to him the project. I also gave him uh, a pool. Uh, he wanted an indoor pool, so I gave him a 70, a 17 meter sphere out of marble in the, in the stomach, in the belly of the mountain in which he can float. This water would come from, uh, from, the, from the snow and the rain that is collected and would be heated by photoelectric cells that are, that are thrown around the site. So there would be steam continuously coming out of it in the middle of the site. He loved that, but the minute he saw mullions, he said, no way, I don't want mullions. You promised that there would be nothing physical. And I told him what five meters high panels uh, with the wind and the whatever, we need mullions. And so he got really upset. He told me I was a charlatan. I didn't deliver what I had promised. Um, a couple of weeks later, he shows up to Beirut with his 70 meter long yacht. And he calls me up and says, come down to the machine room. So I go down to the machine room. I see these two wonderful turbines. And he tells me these were developed for the military, for submarines. And uh, there's no other private vessel in the world that has them. The reason why I installed, I installed them is because I want to cruise at night and I want zero decibels. I don't want to hear anything. I said, wow. He said, the mullions have to go. And so the mullions went. Uh, we developed a system where the, whereby the, the windows literally recede in the ground and the tracks also recede in the ground. We sent it to Germany to experts and they priced it at around 8 million euros just for the glazing. And he was OK, but it didn't happen for political reasons. The house of the banker is another very sophisticated, uh, technically speaking, sophisticated machine that I've built with local artisans. It has 52 engines in its roof um, so that he can sleep under the stars uh, with no roof, no walls, literally. It also has a balcony. See. It also has a balcony that moves up and down the facade so he can go from the living room to the pool on his balcony. This is a small twin villa at 2,000 meters of altitude that has no facade on the main street. You go up the stairs and there's a long pool on which you can float above 2,000 meters of altitude and above all the tip of the mounts of Mount Lebanon. Sometimes a very, a very simple pleasure can be celebrated in architecture. And that is enough. I'm not going to talk about Germany, because we're not here to talk about Germany. I won't talk about Italy either, because we're not here to talk about Italy. And I will also skip Kuwait, which was my first project in the Gulf. But I'll take you to this guy, the son of the dictator. Right before the Arab Spring, the son of the dictator, or the family of the dictator, the king of the kings, had a surplus of around $40, $40 billion a year they didn't know what to do with. So at some point, the son of the dictator decided to give back some of it to the country. And this was one of the five projects that were commissioned. It was supposed to be the gate of Africa. Um, uh, 750,000 square meters of development. Uh, I asked where the site was. They told me here. And they never tell me exactly where it is. This is a town called Sebha. So I ended up doing a building that is seven and a half kilometers long, the longest building on Earth by 100 meters wide, a single level, but it's just a topographical manipulation along which the program is spread. It would make Dubai look stupid and the wall of China completely archaic. But obviously, that didn't happen because of the Arab Spring. So much for the Arab Spring, so much for modernity in the Arab world. This is Bahrain. You see that we, I mean, the Gulf, we Arabs have inherited the worst out of the Anglo-Saxon culture. So we have American, Canadian, South African, Australian architects, basically English speaking architects producing this kind of crap for us. This is modernity. It's very sad because at some point in the 40s, the 50s and 60s, there was a local modernity coming out of the Arab world. Today, it's imported, it's bought. And I don't think you can buy modernity. See, this is SOM, the tallest concrete building in the world, 400 meters, but it does that. What for? Who knows? It's stupid. There's another one that also does that, but also for absolutely no reason. So that's modernity in the Arab world, so much for modernity. I and mean, we produce all sorts of stupid, 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 dumb symbols like this that uh, 
even if they, they I don't think they look interesting by satellite, but let's, let's buy the idea. Huh? You look at it from above, it gives you that, but then that is this, a nightmare. That is this, believe it or not. So much for Dubai. Saudi Arabia, uh, my first adventure in Saudi Arabia was a fantastic project with a fantastic lady who was a, a, a Saudi Arabian princess. It was a woman's only leisure facility and probably the, probably the most erotic project I've ever designed. And that's why it got censored and never got built. So I will skip that too. Uh, Arabs, uh, well, in, today in the Gulf, they, you have to give them what they don't have. So this was a competition for a tall building. I didn't give them a tall building. I gave them uh, suspended plates of topography that could be inhabited because they don't have topography. And they float in the sky because it's simply surreal and it's not real. Um, it would be that against the stupidity of the tall whatever. That didn't happen either. I'll skip the art collector. for whom I designed the, the largest stretched canvas in the world. He started, he started his life in fashion and became the biggest fashion retailer in the region. This was one of his, one of his mega stores and became later on an art collector. So the building essentially that I had designed for his art foundation was three layers. One which was the automobile layer, the débarcadère, where you come in and out on this very violent highway. And the arrival of the car was an experience also. Um, then the middle piece, which is this biggest stretched canvas, which had this schizophrenic kind of uh, uh, attitude where it was art, but it was also advertisement. Was it fashion? Was it art? Who knows? And maybe art, maybe fashion is more culturally relevant than art at this point. So this was problematic in itself. And above was what was to be the longest bar in the world, 110 meters long by only four and a half meters of width in a frame. That was art. He didn't buy it. That was uh, one of the temporary buildings of the early years. It was a bank pavilion. I worked a lot with banks. Uh, banks can be very interesting because they're very sophisticated in the strategies of deployment on the territory. This was 12 minutes away from the Syrian border at the time we were still under Syrian occupation. So on the one hand, you had politicians going to Syria, getting to get their orders from the Assad family. And on the other side, you had something far more interesting happening. You had cars coming from Syria with plastic bags full of cash because there were no private banks in, in Damascus. So this building is kind of our revenge for Damascus through the, through the banking sector. It's turned this, it turns its butt towards Damascus. It's got a closed carapace. It collects the money and it spits it out towards Beirut with the ATM machine. You see that the, the mouth of the building is an ATM machine. Sometimes just an ATM machine can be, can be also very architectural. Uh, I do sometimes work for the art uh, sector. I call it the art industry. Uh, the man you see hung by the balls is the British ambassador who was the first to inaugurate this piece in 2006. Um, this is my office and uh, my angels floating around the unbuilt projects. I have a red floor in my office to keep my guys nervous and aware and awake. So I've been living with a red floor every single day for over 10 hours a day. Uh, this is why maybe I'm a bit too nervous. And the curator for whom uh, we had uh, designed and produced a piece uh, for the Sandretto Foundation, which in fact is a, a piece of military equipment to exchange prisoners of war across enemy lines. It's called POW. And uh, a piece I designed for the um, Maxi Museum in Rome, uh, derailing Beirut. It goes through uh, areas that have been fetishized in post-war Beirut. And it's basically a circuit for the, for the curious tourist, the intellectual tourist, who wants to consume the city very, very fast. This is what it's about. So we projected these onto the city as a new layer. And you can see them. Uh, so you can go in and out of the Holiday Inn Hotel in a fraction of a second, whoosh, like this. And we conceived uh, the capsule in which the tourist can travel with his head smack in the middle of the detonator for a full, full uh, extreme uh, experience. And we built the damn thing. This is it in, in my office. Uh, 
on the way into my office. We rolled it around the city, so we had a lot of problems with the authorities. Some of my guys went to jail for that on the Corniche. And finally, the doctor, uh, my story with the doctor, was in fact my older brother in 1986 stole a rat from the Brown University um, uh, laboratory. They had these experimental rats that, had, that were stripped from their immunity system, and he replaced it by a normal rat. And him and his colleague uh, brought this rat to his apartment. I was paid $50 a day to watch over the rat to make sure the rat is okay. It was in a transparent cage until they found a donor body. And the idea was to amputate the donor body, take the toe, and plant it uh, instead, and take the, amputate the rat from his leg and plant the toe and use the rat's uh, vessels to irrigate the toe. And the idea is that on the long run, this could serve if, if some is, at some point you lose a, a finger and maybe an arm later on with a pig, uh, you can irrigate this, this organ and keep it alive until your body is ready to take it back. Um, they found two days later, three days later, a donor in Massachusetts. It was an old lady who had a very ugly toe. They implanted the toe. They brought back the rat. I had been watching the rat for two days, so he didn't have a lot of time to sleep. And my brother was calling all the time, how's the rat, how's the rat, how's the toe? The toe is bluish green, it's turning, yeah, whatever. And then my brother goes into an operation, doesn't get out for a while, calls me back uh, six hours later, I'd fallen asleep. I look at the rat, the rat was dead. He had killed himself trying to get out because it was a transparent cage and he suffocated at the corner of the cage. So much for me watching over the rat. Uh, when I decided to go back to Beirut, a few years later he told me, you're gonna act like a rooster on top of a garbage dump. It's a saying in Arabic. And every time I walked by these posters, I was the mascot of the Johnny Walker campaign uh, here. I remember my brother used to say, well, if you look closely at the, at the poster, you will see that, uh, and I was on the, on the eight o'clock news every day for about a year, uh, 30 seconds commercial for Johnny, Wal for Johnny Walker whiskey. But look closely here, I am much bigger than Paris Hilton and I'm above her. Not a lot of architects can say that. That'll be it for tonight. Thank you very much.